and it was allegedly originally very close to Corey Fleming, right? So these case details deal directly with Russell Lafee and how he factors into some of these um, financial settlement fraud claims, the financial settlement fraud, and specifically the insurance schemes that were being run uh, directly out of Alex Murdoch's law firm in practice, his official practice. Um, so these would be some very, very key, important items, and uh, I'm going to be spreading that around to, to really get it, you know, the attention it deserves. And I hope that you will also uh, continue to spread the word on that. Now, I have been approached, I mean, we have been approached by uh, just some different areas, like, uh, for example, uh, the Manimal Reacts channel and things like that could possibly do. You know, kind of a show, uh, a show type of collaboration, essentially. Um, and I'm not, since I speak for the whole channel and we have a very small uh, team here, I'm not going to be engaging in anything like that right now because there are a lot of key issues that need to be resolved. And we're going to be doing a live broadcast, meaning a live show. Uh, one of our first real official live broadcasts where I'm going to answer very important questions on Alex Murdoch, uh, the case, overall other parts that are in the background, the deal directly with the Murdoch case, and why and how these settlement schemes got done. But you're going to cover things that are of a very important nature on this channel, meaning key items are going to be covered related to the exclusive information on Nathan Tutin. I'm going to be exposing that because, as I said, that information um, starts out primarily being exclusive uh, to the JTC channel. We have some very exclusive information that needs to be exposed on that, how he may have indeed played a part in assisting in the homicides that occurred at Moselle and assisting in possibly the cover-up of the homicides around Stephen Smith and other issues. And then I would just say it is much more likely that we will do a collab or collaborative show um, once, we get, once we get a little past the 2000 mark, once we get right up there. Um, with JD the lawyer or some of the associates that are working with JD because we want to speak directly to these key issues of the murder situation, you know, the empire uh, that was built over all this time. And we don't want to be on somebody who has, you know, 100,000 or 80,000 subscriber lists or something like that because uh, shortly... We're going to be exposing some information here that is very interesting. It's exclusive, of course, also to the JTC channel. That's going to receive a lot of positive attention. And it's also going to receive a whole lot of negative attention. And it deals directly with, of course, the Nicola Bully case and similar things. So if you're noticing these interesting links between missing persons, possible missing persons, in the United Kingdom area, and also the issues of these court cases that were dealing directly with uh, Alexander Murdoch, and also with, of course, uh, Randolph Mur Murdoch, or Randy Murdoch, then you wouldn't be that far off the mark, because they are related, they are linked in certain ways. And we are going to be exposing some of that information exclusively on this channel in videos as well as our upcoming live broadcast, which will also be to answer specific questions on other aspects in the background situation around the Murdoch case overall and around the background dealing with Stephen Bertolino and so on overall. So that you can certainly 
be looking forward to. But as you watch this video, pay very close attention to what is revealed, actually for the first time in many cases, on Russell Lafee, who that is, why his name is so important, and how it deals literally, in a literal direct sense, with all of these insurance fraud schemes, as well as some of the serial killers overseas. Thank you again. Verzi Affidavit by Michael Verzi. Now, uh, the number of things here will be fairly exclusive, meaning no one has seen these types of things most certainly before. Uh, there was part of this placed in USA, a USA Today article when it first came out. However, getting a hold of these actual documents has been, you know, has been difficult, is what I'll say. Um, so I won't go over the whole thing here, but this is the key piece from what's known as the Michael Bursey Affidavit. In, der in derogation of the above stated duties, it appears Defendant Murdoch engaged in the coordinated effort with Defendant Lafitte and PSB, <clears throat> that's Palmetto State Bank, to actively hide plaintiff's settlement from him, and instead of paying the plaintiff his portion of settlements, directed those funds to themselves. It appears Defendant Murdoch actively worked in cooperation with Defendant Lafitte and the Palmetto State Bank to benefit themselves first by seeking and obtaining court approval to substitute Defendant Lafitte as personal representative here and after PR for the estate and for late for the late claims of Miss Badger's heirs, uh, Mrs. Badger's heirs, which include the plaintiff. It appears defendants including Lafitte, conspired to do so despite the plaintiff being an adult who had previously served competently as PR in the case for a year and a half until uh, a year and a half until the settlement was reached. It appears defendants did this for the primary purpose of hiding plaintiff settlement funds from the plaintiff in order to enrich themselves. It appears defendant Murdoch failed to do so of disclosing this information he was obligated under, instead not informing the plaintiff that the settlement was eminent and not informing the plaintiff of his statutory right to serve as the PR, as he would expect to be entirely loyal to defendants and not the plaintiff. It further appears defendant Murdoch arranged to pay defendant Russell Lucius Lafitte $35,000 as the PR fee for a $500 settlement in the estate survival action, for which he statutory, uh, statutorily was entitled to no more than $25, and an additional $35,000 fee as the PR for the plaintiff's personal injury case in which defendant Le, uh, Russell Lafitte never served as the PR. It further appears that defendants sought court approval of the wrongful death settlement and the case, at least in part on the affidavit, that Defendant Lafitte falsely stated wherein plaintiff had renounced his rights as a statutory beneficiary in the wrongful death, uh, death claim and settlement, thus fraudulently, fraudulently depriving the plaintiff of his share in the settlement itself. It appears then that Defendant Murdoch fraudulently induced the plaintiff to sign the disbursement sheet purportedly stating the amount of the settlement of his personal injury claim as $3,100,000, which is the purported disbursement of the proceeds. However, it is alleged and appears that Defendant Murdoch never informed the plaintiff, uh, including the Badgers in this particular case, of the settlement for the claim, nor the recipients of those funds, instead telling them that their personal injury case settled for a substantially smaller amount. The disbursement sheet contains specific dollar amounts only on page one, and plaintiff's signature, meaning Badger's signature, it is alleged and appears that defendant Murdoch showed plaintiff a different page that indicated a substantially smaller settlement amount. It appears defendant Murdoch later replaced page one, 
to create a false impression the plaintiff was shown on that page of a true settlement amount, which was three million one hundred thousand. Furthermore, the disbursement amounts shown on page one appear to contain false statements at the cost of taxpayers, including the PR fee to defend the defeat that should not have been applicable to the plaintiff's individual injury claim. So essentially, what it proves um, in this particular uh, case, yeah, it appears that defendant Murdoch obtained the plaintiff's signature on the release and receipt form from the plaintiff's share of his deceased wife's estate. It's my understanding from conversations with Badger's counsel that one or more defendants are asserting the document releases defendants from plaintiff's claims to the case. Now, I don't know how much of that is true, of whether you know, it truly releases these claims uh, or any of that, okay? But I was able to verify based upon the Verzi affidavit, Michael Verzi, okay? That essentially what Russell Lafitte did in this case is he set up a separate entity, okay? That's why they say they were not able to verify certain issues around the PR fees or sometimes, you know, they would also call something like that the, the Ferris fees because it might be related to one of those legal actions. They just, you know, they try to put nicknames on certain things sometimes. Um, but that's why they're saying that in regards to those fees for the estate. In other words, if in the event that something occurred with the Badger estate, it was not it was held an equitable title so it was set to essentially go to the main uh, you know the main member of the badger family um, but because of how russell defeat set this up okay he actually set up two separate entities and actually when reviewing it he set up essentially three separate entities to be honest because he was there in a kind of a chief position for the palmetto state bank okay that's one it's one entity then another entity he set up which was also false was used as kind of the go-between to kind of uh just transfer funds through a through a three prong pipeline, so in other words, you had Mr. Russell Lafitte. He was managing what appeared to be a legitimate insurance claim settlement company. You know, settlement estate area where that they could essentially retrieve and disperse assets lawfully. Then you add Russell Lafitte with another entity. Um, which clearly was not used for that express purpose at all, um, that Russell Lafitte had claimed would untangle or untie the hands of the Badger, of Badger estate in the Badger case. But what it in fact did, see, this is what the Verzi uh, affidavit proves, which is what I wanted to really be able to see it up close and be able to cover that um, what it did was it tied up the plaintiff's estate or the badger estate in other words inside of another entity a type of redirection in other words folks a slush fund based entity a third rung and where all of the funds were transferred which would normally be transferred for the legal process the required legal process for settling of insurance claims and settling the insurance fees on the insurance claims they were instead transferred directly into an account tied to Russell Lafitte's personal name and they did this scheme you know several different times so any of the quote 
insurance claims that went, you know, the direction that they wanted, they didn't actually give anything back to essentially Badger or the Badger estate. Instead, they were transferred over to Russell Lafitte, you know, and this was kind of a, oh, I'm going to say this is a scheme that would take somebody with a certain amount of real computer criminal knowledge. So I'm of the belief still I cannot buy that all of this, the, the three-pronged scheme that Russell Lafitte was engaged in, that this was all Alexander Murdoch's idea. I do not buy that premise at all, even based on uh, the Michael Verzi uh, affidavits and the paperwork from Michael Verzi, because again, it's that seems like a simple con. You know, you set up two separate accounts. One is actually somewhat legitimate and is being used for the settlement and uh, a proper allocation, really, of insurance claims, or at least the alleged adjustment of insurance claims. The other is not being used for any claims, and they are making a statement and claim, you know, that it is going to go back to the estate for the plaintiff. And in reality, all it's being used for is to transfer funds between the actual plaintiff's estate directly into the the personal defendant's account. So the bank account, a way to transfer proceeds, right? To kind of be able to easily, without anyone noticing, just transfer funds directly to yourself. And I can't buy even for a minute because of the complex way that the PSB was set up with this other kind of almost Cayman Island style third rung account that Alexander Murdoch was truly at the head of this scheme. You know, I 100% guarantee and believe most certainly that he was involved in this scheme, that he was acting on his own accord and that he was doing this scheme. Um, he's a little more uh, sinister, at least I would say, in certain respects for his shady shady past history than some of the other uh, family members. But again, just because Randolph or Randy Murdoch is less of a issue and is less sinister, I would say, than Alex uh, Murdoch, of course, doesn't mean anything. And so I'm coming away based upon evidence that I've started to really explore uh, that Randy Murdoch, because there's three accounts and then they use kind of a fourth account sometimes, apparently, to try to pass off certain settlements between each other. So I believe that this type of just scheme that they have done, given Russell Lafitte's signature, is on some of these insurance documents. It's literally legally on it. That um, Randy Murdoch is more than likely, is what I will say, behind this entire scheme, this entire scandal, um, in, in a significant sense. And it was pawned off onto, how you want to say it, a, you know, a third party, pawned off onto Alex Murdoch, just to make it seem like he was absolutely the one behind all of this and was competent enough to conceal the actual location of where these funds were being transferred to. Okay? And I don't believe that, even for a second, based upon legal records that I've dug into, how difficult they were to truly be able to research them, top to bottom. I believe it was not Russell Defeat uh, in charge of this kind of scheme. I believe most certainly it was more than likely Randy Murdoch and someone else who was actually physically at the top and in charge of this scheme. 
and when they conducted it to be able to transfer the funds between the two areas. You know, they kind of make it look a little bit legitimate, right, folks? They have to make a go-between. They have to make it seem legitimate. Um, they pawned off the responsibility for this scheme directly onto Alexander Murdoch so that he would seemingly appear like he was the mastermind. We have to keep in mind again that Nathan Tutin, right, he also comes into the picture here. He comes into the picture in huge ways when these injury claims start getting filed. And this right here was only on one estate that got some press attention, which is the Badger Estate. There's another estate which has been very difficult to dig into, and that's the Plyer, uh, also known as the Hannah Plyer Estate. And I'm going to be covering some of that, which has just been interesting overall for me to investigate because it was difficult to even get in, to get inside there. People say all the time, like, well, the Murdochs have this history of doing different things. You know, they've been bootlegging. Um, again, that, in the, in the large scheme of things, you know, hiding some brandy wine or something is nothing compared to defrauding, you know, 10 people or 100 people of all of their funds, especially their insurance funds. And, uh, you know, I believe that 100% such a scheme as has started to be demonstrated here could not have only been done by Alexander Murdoch. He had someone else he was working with, you know, not Russell Lafee, someone else. And I certainly uh, postulate again, I believe Randy Murdoch was very likely involved at the top of this to be able to pawn this scheme off onto more or less the underlings because I do not see Alexander Murdoch as being even uh, really seasoned enough to pull something like this off. I do see it all the time with Randy and whoever he was working with. Thank you again. More to cover on this case. Examination of how the Badger children lost their money casts a light on how these private companies operate. Known as structured settlement factoring companies, they and their investors are legally receiving checks originally meant to provide financial security for the children and others who have sustained these debilitating injuries. In the Badger case, of course, the deals apparently were approved many times by the probate judge, who was among the favorite at the time, according to McClatchy. He has never denied a single company. So it's quite tragic. It's the most despicable predatory behavior I have witnessed in my 17 years of researching any of these uh, companies. And they say, right, they say that something around this... Uh, strange situation involved the uh, the actual the boat crash the uh, settlement for the boat crash and um, it, it is uh, it's just something else you know Arthur's attorney Alex Murdoch stated he negotiated a multi-million dollar settlement which was reached for the wrongful death suit against UPS in late 2012 then came the betrayal. In the years following the wreck, Murdoch, along with former Palmetto State Bank CEO Russell Lafee, quietly stole more than $1.3 million in settlement proceeds and other actual fees, sometimes nicknamed things like, you know, Ferris fees, and uh, every, every area where they were placed as well. Arthur is among a long list of former clients who were defrauded by Murdoch, who has become a household name in an unfolding drama of homicide and financial intrigue. Once the head of a prominent South Carolina family of law, Mr. Murdoch is uh, currently 
in jail awaiting trial on financial charges. The Badger children received other proceeds from the actual wrongful death. However, that money should have been put into a safe account. Of course, none of these accounts that were created uh, were actually, uh, you know, safe accounts. And so, when I go back and I really examine it, you know, it's just, it's tragic for everyone all the way, you know, no matter which way you slice it, because someone really got harmed in this. And uh, most often it was, it was most certainly the victims. You know, little did Arthur know that there was money owed to him and other fees that were also owed to him that could have fixed the problem, enough to buy one of the most expensive houses in Allendale County, is what's alleged. More than $1.3 million was set aside, but uh, disappeared as a result of these suits. So, you know, it just goes to show you, folks, you can't... Be too careful around anything to do uh, with settlements nowadays. It, it happened in, in that particular uh, instance with Satterfield. A lot of people have discussed before. But it happened here with the Badgers and others in a way that's almost far more harmful because they, you know, and I, I don't know the ultimate outcome of that. They had to take care of everything with the hospitals, the medical records, you know, everything themselves. And th that amount could just disappear uh, so quickly is what's quite shocking. So, again, I always like to have uh, your thoughts as well. What are your um, current ideas on this? What do you feel overall about how the Badgers trusted uh, Mr. Lafee and, and also his other attorney. Do you feel anything about this could have been rectified in some way? If they had found out, for example, that Alex Murdoch was actually also showing up there all the time, you know, and was working with Lafee. Anyway, sound off. Let me know in your comments. Thank you. Briefly, but on or about January 28th of 2011, uh, Mr. Arthur Badger and Donna Badger, along with others who were uh, accompanying them, were involved in an automobile wreck that was caused directly by a UPS delivery truck. As a result of the acts and omissions of UPS, as well as its, its uh, principal driver, Arthur and Donna Badger both sustained personal injuries. Donna Badger met her untimely uh, demise. At the time of her death, Donna Badger was married to Arthur Badger, and they had six children. Shortly after the wreck, Arthur Badger retained the services of defendant Alex Murdoch to represent him in pursuing alleged claims against UPS on behalf of Arthur Badger individually for damages he sustained as a result of his own personal injuries as well as on behalf of the estate itself. So that was very interesting um, and I won't get too into it but most certainly UPS with all of the legal uh, issues going on, going on uh, kind of around that company now they've always had some interesting characters some uh, real problematic people who have worked at the uh, at the UPS organization um, but anyway I just find it fascinating to see they essentially emptied right everything that was in the accounts for Arthur and Donna Badger which it, it's a tragedy to me because these accounts were designated, they were set up, they were set up in a specific, um, you know, kind of insurance designated settlement agreement, and it was supposed to cover all of the hospital costs, all of the care costs, all of the private issues dealing directly with 
Arthur Badger and certainly others involved in, in all of these uh, problems. And instead, Russell Lafitte, he admitted to even on the stand, he directly turned it into kind of a personal checking account for himself. Somehow gained access to it, turned it into a personal checking account, and was sending all of these funds directly to Alex Murdoch. And the way that he was hiding some of these checks and passing funds directly over into the account that would most certainly belong to Alex Murdoch uh, is, uh, is highly unusual. You would have to say that he was definitely involved in something of a bit of an advanced, you know, kind of three-leg of the table type of uh, scheme. Because just doing that directly from... I suppose an attorney's account or the attorney's estate account, you know, there there's safeguards and restrictions for doing anything like that. So he had to have gotten around all of these uh, particular issues to be able to do this. And I find that fascinating. So again, keep on, uh, give your feedback, folks. What are your personal feelings on this? Thank you. And the PSB, or Palmetto State Bank, was the continuation, continuation for a symbi symbiotic relationship existing between PMPED and PSB. In this symbiotic relationship, PMPED sent clients to PSB, meaning Palmetto State Bank, for high interest rate paying litigation loans through which PMPED clients would either receive an advance against their future case recovery and money to help pay expenses during litigation, and PSB would also charge the client's interest rates ranging from 18 to 25 percent. In addition, through the settlements PMPED achieved, it created a large depository account or accounts for PSB, which reflected well on the balance sheet for the bank. Finally, BMPED created free opportunities for the leadership board of PSB by handpicking PSB officers to play role of personal representative or conservator for cases and enhancing fees in the process. So in other words, folks, it wasn't enough, right? It was not enough. At least that's what we're starting to get a feeling of, right? Sound off on what, what you feel about this issue. Uh, what are your ideas of it? Um, but what is uh, crucial to me as I really examined, examined this and gone back over it is um, it seems in this case it wasn't enough to just create a new account, you know, a new bank account in a new city, in a new area, give it a specific company ID and basically sell it as though it was coming directly through a specific insurance company all the time, you know, and it was taking care of and therefore handling everyone and anyone's specific claims and causes of actions and things like that. It wasn't enough to do something like, like that. What they actually did uh, completely instead of that, to be exact, is they had officers from basically PMPED law firm and their affiliates handpicked and approved directly through the Palmetto State Bank to oversee each and every one of these accounts and new company IDs. So if they created, you know, apparently they created three of these specific entities, well, what they had in charge of each time one of these accounts and the entity was created was an officer directly from PMPED or somehow affiliated with it to manage all of its affairs, conduct all of its accounting, take care of literally all, its, all of its legal records. We know that now through the grapevine showing that Nathan Tootin was actually going between these entities, apparently servicing every single 
you know, company with their records, apparently servicing them with specific checks, apparently cashing specific documents, right? That's what we started to finally see. That's what we learned about uh, in the background here. Um, but they would oversee the board of the new company or the new entity that was created. So therefore, they would control, right? In a way, they would control how the account was used and who the account was redirected to, in other words. Like PMPED, Palmetto State Bank was a generational family institution in Hampton County. PSB prospered under the ownership and control of the Lafitte family, just as Alex Murdoch had ascended to his seat officially at the top of the PMPED firm, a parallel on a parallel track. In other words, in other words, while Russell Lafitte was climbing, Alex Murdoch was automatically getting promoted for whatever the reason was. I'm not going to speculate on what the reason or anything was, you know, for now, but for whatever that reason was, to the very, very top of the group of PMPED, you know, law. The two rising lions of their families came together for the prosecution of the, of the Plyler cases. In order to have Lafitte appointed as the personal representative for the estate of Angela and Justin, an application needed to be made to the probate court for the county in their residence at the time of death, which was, which was, uh, which was actually in this case in Richland County. Murdoch and Lafitte would have to secure a renunciation from Ricky Plyler for his rights to serve in the capacity as personal representative. So they were conducting a kind of underhanded probate and the way that they did this probate was most certainly the opposite way you would ever handle a conservatorship. Okay, They were setting up somebody who was allegedly going to help Justin Plyler, um, but that person for some reason ended up being appointed to the head position right, of both the Palmetto State Bank and the estate of Angela and Justin Plyler, which clearly we don't ever see things like that happen, okay, unless there's something that is very wrong. Or, you know, it, on a very, very rare occasion that might happen because the family and the representative share the exact same history and bank or something like that. But on the whole, it does not happen. So what was in it for Lafitte and the Palmetto State Bank? In addition to the continuation of a symbiotic relationship between PMPED, Lafitte stood to earn personal representative fees, which are kind of like Ferris fees, okay, up to 5% from every single settlement or recovery that was made for every potential case. PSP stood to become the potential recipient of vast sums by way of the depository account set up directly for the settlement. And the girl's additional obstacle that stood in the way of having Russell Lafitte appointed as chief conservator for purposes of prosecuting their case um, meant that there needed to be <clears throat> more changes at the PSB. So, and I'm just talking about how it's dealt with in most estates, okay? When you're handling a significant estate, you'll most often handle it with a personal re representative being a very close friend of the family or in nearly all cases that I've seen, just a family member, okay? Just... Justin Plyler himself, rather than Russ, Russell Lafitte. So the fact that they made Russell Lafitte, right, not Justin Plyler, not the estate of Justin Plyler, or any of the above, okay, to be real precise. The fact they made Russell Lafitte instead, not as a consultant role, but more just the overall conservator for the entire estate, should be... Uh, a bit of a red flag, you would think, right? What are your thoughts? You know, what are your, what are your feelings on that?
make sure to leave your comments. You know, we always appreciate getting uh, interesting feedback on this. Um, but when when this occurred, you know, Russell Defeat and the PSB were in Hampton County, and Murdoch and Russell Defeat didn't really know, or it's alleged anyway, they didn't really know each other, you know, all that well. So Russell Lafitte was still taking care of this, and he was named, essentially, which I would agree uh, with the typical argument that he should not have ever been named, to be honest. But he was named and appointed as the chief conservator, and then therefore the overall fiduciary for everything dealing with the Plyler case and the Plyler estate. Um, anything that Justin Plyler signed or anything was all handled directly only by a special personal representative, the, the special representative of the moment, Russell Lafitte. And so he therefore appointed himself, essentially, to approve all hearings, to, I guess, schedule all of the different, you know, matters that were before uh, the court of record as well but also to schedule how the bank, you know, the bank, uh, the banking financial statements would end up looking, right? They're, they're going to look a certain way, no matter what anyone <laughs> speaks about to the contrary. They're certainly going to look a little bit off when you start examining um, these individual financial statements. And you see Really, right? You're you're not seeing Justin and Angela Plyler, you know. You're not seeing Hannah or anyone like that listed in there. For the most part, you're seeing Russell Lafitte, and you're also seeing the name, of course, of perhaps his his personal confidant, which would be Alex Murdoch at the time. In all those different places. So from Alania's money, Lafitte decided that the most prudent thing to do was to buy a new annuity that would pay Alania a monthly sum for the rest of her life. Lafitte prepared notes and calculations in which he projected that Alania's needs would be less than $2,000 per month as a minor and that her annuity would pay her over $10,000 per month for the rest of her natural life. According to Lafitte's calculations, <coughs> The annuity payments alone, you know, would handle everything. So Alania would accumulate over $361,000, allegedly, in his calculations. So, regardless of what anyone uh, really thought about this situation overall, okay, right? They, <clears throat> they chose to go through with it anyway. And so, part of the burden is on... I would certainly suggest um, to all of you, part of the burden would most likely be on Hannah and Justin Plyler for essentially handing conservatorship or nearly sole conservatorship rights over to someone that is not very familiar with anyone. You know, Just handing them directly over, for example, to Russell Lafitte. Because in certain cases and in certain legal situations and cases, you are not allowed to do that, are you? Right? You're kind of restricted in a way from doing something that uh, brash, so to speak. Um, so in this case, you know, they chose to sign that document and chose to name Lafitte as the exclusive conservator, apparently. At least from what's alleged in all of these legal records and so forth. So therefore, it would only be Lafitte who would be going in, allegedly anyway, to all of these courts, to the probate, and to any of these other areas, because, of course, um, according to this, it's his signature there, okay? Um, and according to other records here, uh, Miss... Miss Plyler didn't have the document to be able to sign uh, for any of these types of uh, specific records. So, in a way, Lafitte knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he was taking advantage of someone who was not fit, um, 
or at least not aware enough of the different methodologies themselves, okay? And in a way they were they were taken for a ride, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly uh, agree that they were taken for a ride. Um, it's just the key issue here is Alex Murdoch received a lot of these fees. So Russell Lafitte as conservator for the Plyer Estate loaned $40,000 to Alex Murdoch. The loan was documented as having been accomplished by a transfer between accounts straight across. So, and, you know, you'd have to speak directly to an attorney, okay, most certainly, because there are certain legal circumstances where something like that would have to be done or is allowed, you know, as long as the lawyer is like a very close friend of the family uh, or is a member of the family, they can transfer, they can do something similar to that, okay, where they can transfer funds from a specific area dealing with the plaintiff's estate into another area to be able to preserve and support the family, you know, to help everyone out uh, who's in that situation. But most of the time, 99% of the time, you are not, as far as I'm aware, going to uh, ever run into anything approaching that type of situation. So what occurred here is interesting, is what I would say, right? It's a little bit of an outlier. It's, uh, it's as though they handed over the house keys, you know, and everything else to Russell Lafee just because they liked something about him, you know, and they handed everything, including the, the keys to the front door, over to him, therefore, and <clears throat> inadvertently when handing it over to Mr. Lafee, from what I'm seeing now, based upon how these accounts were set up, they also handed it directly to Alexander Murdoch. And I think that um, Alex planned part of that. I do believe that that's kind of the purpose of this in a way. Uh, but I'm more than, in reality, I'm more than lean towards the direction that Randy actually made Alex the scapegoat. And he came up with, you know, this wonderful insurance fraud scheme and the kind of three card Monty type of scheme that ended up occurring here. But it's very, very damaging. Okay. We can see how much it hurt Hakeem Pickney. And we can see how much it hurt everything to do with the Plyer estate in a way because, you know, everything that they felt was there for their land and their ownership trust uh, for the deed, for the land, it all got handed over. Maybe even unknowingly, maybe they were not fully aware and cognizant of everything occurring here, right? Because it's a little, it's a little unusual. Uh, but it all got handed over directly to Lafitte. And also, in that way, to Mr. Murdoch, because apparently Lafitte was paying Murdoch directly, going by the financial statements. So very interesting. And uh, what are your further thoughts? What are your ideas about how much, you know, the pliers especially were clearly defrauded? Thank you again. Sound off below. Long that I've attempted to really understand um, and get underneath with this. Okay, because I'm not going to show the entire um, thing because I don't. They don't allow... Uh, showing the you know the entire legal document in certain cases, so you're just going to see the parts of it that are the most uh, most vitally uh, important. And these have been hard, actually pretty hard to find, hard to dig into. Okay. Customer's personal checking account was used allegedly a second or third time. At the time, the bank customer was overdrawn on his personal checking account at Palmetto State Bank. Russell Lucius Lafee transferred loaned, uh, loaned you know, funds 
from the HP conservatorship account into the bank customer's personal checking account to cover the overdraft fees. Thereafter, Russell Lucius Lafee continued to extend the bank customer hundreds of thousands of dollars in unsecured loans of credit and transferred the loaned funds thereby into the bank customer's personal checking account. Each time Russell Lucius Lafee transferred funds from the HP conservatorship account, the bank customer was overdrawn in his personal checking account by tens of thousands of dollars. Russell Lucius Lafee extended each loan to cover the bank customer's overdrawn personal checking account. So, <clears throat> this is interesting, folks, and this is a little unbelievable um, for me to see exactly how this was done because they had set this up, okay? They had essentially set this up as a structured settlement agreement. So these were structured settlement funds. Therefore, they were supposed to, legally anyway, in the legal sense, be used to pay out over a designated period of time, right? to some of the beneficiaries, to some of the other um, trustees and personal uh, responsible donors and uh, advocates on the estate, for the estate. Um, especially in the case of the, uh, the plier settlement. It was supposed to pay out over a designated period of time all the allotted settlement funds to pay for these serious injuries that they endured and to pay for the injuries that Hakeem uh, Pickney personally endured and others endured and, and take care of their physical uh, problems and, and their real, real problems uh, overall over that, uh, over that time period. However, the structured settlements Okay, that were signed off by the actual official judge did not get used in any of those fashions. They were signed off on a kind of a judge who does rubber stamps, I guess, in, in the county, you know, in the county area, and uh, they just decided to sell all of these structured settlement funds to create more cash. Now, we have to remember, of course, at the time, uh, Alex Murdoch was essentially bankrupt, and, you know, they had already uh, gone through several bankruptcies, allegedly, and he didn't have anything coming in from his private, um, his private business and, and things like that, which would actually cover all of these alleged accounts of debt. <clears throat> so it helps make a little more sense of what in the world truly went on here. But, you know, $8,200 was transferred to a third individual associated with the bank customer. $29,000 was given to a, a Honory Creek Motors representative. Uh, $49,500 was wire transferred directly to Southern Crane. So they looted these accounts. And I'm still not clear on exactly how they did all of this because structured settlements, you know, are closed accounts. No one can really access any of those accounts designated periods except you know a specific person but they they did and they turned each of these structured settlements literally if you want to call it that right into a type of personal checking account for them directly and that's that's one of the reasons why I would say that so many are understandably upset with um what happened around the Murdoch, you know, the overall Murdoch situation? 
it's certainly 100% clear that that is what happened in this case. Um, and it can't be denied that Russell Lucius Lafee directly took over some of these accounts, these alleged accounts that were used for the estate, you know, that were used for the personal banks tied to the estate, and they ended up paying uh, directly straight to uh, Russell Lafee many more times, you know, than anyone knows. And then they ended up being handed over because it was as though they turned it into a personal checking ac uh, account, okay? They ended up being handed directly over to uh, Alex Murdoch at that point. Anyway, what are your uh, further uh, thoughts? What are your comments on this interesting developing story? Sound off. Let me know what you think. Thank you. This is a very, this is interesting and needs to be included. Jeannie Seconder stated that the firm immediately alerted the bank to Murdoch's dismissal. Russell Lafitte's response initially was in disbelief. She said, shocked. Then he said he was worried the bank would lose money. Limehouse and Jeannie Seconder went over a series of disbursement checks in which Russell Lafitte later provided her uh, with these checks at their actual meetings. I could tell these were things that were benefiting Alex Murdoch. The woman stated she did not learn about Russell Lafee, Russell Lafee's alleged involvement in Murdoch's purported uh, insurance scheme until emails sent years ago between the banker were uncovered in February. Second year stated that she loves her brother-in-law and trusts him, but saw some things that caused for a lot of concern. As Mr. Murdoch's banker, Russell Lafee would have likely been privy to the magnitude of his personal debt, an amount which has mounted and tripled since at least 2011. Seconder asked about uh, what occurred, and Murdoch, from what she understood, um, the law firm was supposed to receive attorney fees in the case settled by Murdoch and friend Chris Wilson. However, the money was collected and dispersed through Wilson's office, and they received money for expenses, but never the fees. So Murdoch apparently deducted all of that, and that's interesting because it proves he was very, uh, very much concerned over his debt, right? You say that's a great reason for concern. Um, but it also proves essentially that Russell Lafee played a role in some way, which is what I was looking for in uh, relationship to when the boat crashed. He was there directing certain disbursements and apparently he was there uh, involved in some way in kind of a uh, third-hand representative role in settling the actual settlements and the fees for those settlements for the boat wreck itself. So why was he, you know, not charged in relationship to the boat? Uh, the boat incident, the areas where it's clear he was involved? I don't know. Uh, but we'll be examining more on this key issue related to the boat crash itself and where Russell Lafitte, you know, shows up in that in other videos as well. So thank you. So, and that's the interesting case of Russell Lafitte. Very few know he was actually involved with Mr. Murdoch in uh, nearly all of these situations and in a lot more legal cases than the media has claimed. So if you enjoyed it, please be sure to get this out to uh, all your colleagues as well. Appreciate it.